on this Sabbath, which is the first Sabbath of this Black History Month, I want to just talk to you from this passage on the subject I've entitled, The Blood Speaks. The Blood Speaks. Pray with me, gracious God. Make me just a nail upon the wall, securely fastened in its place. And there upon that nail so small, hang a picture of your lovely face. So all in this place may truly know that it is you here by your grace. Amen. Anything or anybody that rises and exalts itself above Christ is sin. And all sin requires a blood sacrifice of death. Mark sandwiches this story of Christ's transfiguration between two conversations about his death and his resurrection. Mark writes to a Gentile audience to portray Jesus as heaven's eternal Valentine's gift of love and grace for all people. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus predicts his death as that sacrifice. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And then in Mark chapter 9, verse 9, Jesus says to Peter, James and John, don't tell anybody what you have seen till the Son of Man were to rise from the dead. Mark structures this story to show the glory of the transfiguration eclipsing the shame of Christ's death and the victorious resurrection for he is the sacrificial lamb of God. And so the Mount of Transfiguration, on that Mount Jesus appears glorified. His divinity flashes through his humanity for he alone with his precious shed blood can satisfy both God and fallen humanity. In Mark chapter 9 verses 2 to 9, his transfiguration story shines with luminous glory. Here Jesus takes his closest disciples, Peter, James, and and John and leads them up into a high unnamed mountain by themselves. Let me just pause here parenthetically to say being close to Jesus may require you to climb some mountains. Sometimes we love our time with Jesus while in the plains and valleys for there we find in him a comforting presence. But following Jesus may require us to climb the mountainside and there we may face temptations, tests, and trials, yet Jesus may lead us way up on high just to behold his glory. If you feel very close to God this morning, yet you struggle to make progress in life, just know Jesus might be leading you upward. If you find yourself exhausted, yet still faithful and trusting, he might be leading you up some great pinnacled peak where you might catch a brand new glimpse of his glory. If your body aches and you feel winded in your Christian walk. He has promised never to leave you, never to leave you alone. Sometimes when I find my road rough and rocky, I just got to bow my head and sing that African-American spiritual. I'm climbing up on the rough side of the mountain. I must Hold to God, his powerful hand. I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain. I'm doing my best to make it in. Just, just look at the text. Look at the text. He leads them up to a high mountain 
And he was transfigured there before them. That means changed and transformed. His clothing shined with a luminescent glory, white as snow. His face glowed radiantly. Then Mark records these disciples saw Elijah and Moses appear. Moses who climbed Mount Sinai to receive the law. And Elijah who climbed Mount Carmel and called down fire from heaven. Both now appeared talking with Jesus in all of his glory. Oh, what a beautiful picture our Lord appears talking to Moses who gave the law to inform every legalistic uh, law person that they too must talk to Jesus for he alone fulfills the whole law and our Lord appears talking to Elijah to let every end time Bible thumping prophetic timeline calculating present truth preaching three angels message teaching vegetarian veggie link eating Sabbath keeping preacher and member know that every Bible prophecy past present and future finds fulfillment and completion and realization in Jesus Christ our Lord ah oh, but some trouble hides in this Bible story look at verse 5 look at verse 5 then Peter said let us make three tabernacles one for thee one for Moses and one for Elias you see Peter didn't know what to say mm -hmm. what do you do when three powerful spiritual leaders show up you've got Moses on the one side and Elijah on the other side and the Lord Jesus right in the middle Peter says let's just build a church house for all three of them and folks therein lies the trouble in the Bible the fallen nature of our humanist drives us to enshrine earthly leaders in churches and temples and tabernacles mm -hmm. we seek to follow everyone and everything but Jesus God gave both Moses and Elijah as divinely appointed leaders but all human beings possess a drive that compels us to use God's gifts as a source of division separation and pride Peter missed this the picture that Christ must be glorified and exalted Peter missed the truth that the Mosaic law and Elijah's prophetic message culminate and resonate in the person of Christ Jesus. Peter lost sight of the glorified Christ who alone makes us brand new. He focused himself on what he can make with God's leaders. It is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter now stands poised to start some trouble in the Bible. I can hear them now. What, 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 what temple are you worshiping at? Hmm? Oh, I go to Moses' tabernacle, and oh, I go to uh, Elijah's tabernacle. I think it's better. Oh, no, you must know that Jesus' tabernacle is best. The sin of exalting anything or anybody to compete with Christ Jesus lurks and lingers in this passage but it always leads to a polarization of our humanity it establishes an us versus them group dynamic human nature wants to establish Moses followers over here and Elijah's followers over there though Christ Jesus bids us all to follow him and the moment you separate and divide human beings you set up future generations for racism prejudice ethnic pride religious superiority bigotry and ethnocentricity oh but thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift in Christ Jesus he bridges the divide between Moses and Elijah he unifies all who follow Moses and all who follows Elijah if Moses lived and led and pointed to Jesus Elijah lived and led and pointed to Jesus and now Jesus came God glorified him and all must follow him as he leads us every step of the way but Peter missed all all this because he didn't know what to say and he just felt too scared in the present moment he says let's take these prominent leaders historical church folk leaders God has given us exalt them alongside the glorified Christ and build temples oh I'm so glad my own mother taught me son when you feel scared and don't know what to say just shut up and say nothing because it's far better to remain silent and be thought a fool 
than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. And that's what's going on in our world today. We don't just have trouble in the Bible, but we got some trouble in the world, trouble in the world caused by fearful folks who should be silent. God made of one blood all nations, and Jesus calls all of us on our spiritual climb upward and higher to God's throne. Oh, but while beholding the glorious beauty of Jesus, uh, years ago somebody said, let's call division and separation amongst God's family. Let's create different races and ideologies and philosophies and religions and churches so that people can focus on themselves instead of the luminous and glory and beauty and majesty of Jesus. Ah, don't you get it twisted now. I'm not saying differences cause trouble. Our God loves diversity and calls us to work together and celebrate our differences so differences don't cause trouble. Taking our eyes off Jesus does. Fixating on self and glorifying our flesh does. Building temples that enshrine our cherished leaders does. Because the moment we build up earthly temples and religions and races, we fixate on our differences. And when we focus on our differences, we naturally seek to evaluate and the quality and the viability and the superiority of the person based on their traits and characteristics. And that kind of thinking spells all the trouble in the world because there is no characteristic, no one characteristic, no one phenotype, and no one kind of complexion that can accurately measure race nor nationality. And nobody chooses their culture, their language, their race, or their heritage. God and God alone chooses all of that for you as God's gift to you. But somebody somewhere came along and used the blessed gifts God gave to create a division that turns our focus off of Christ and now the whole world fixates inwardly on self and on the flesh of our, their cultural heritage, the flesh of their racial background, their skin color, their ethnic heritage, their religious traditions, and their sexual orientation. We identify ourselves by where we came from, what language we speak, and what color we are. We fixate on our legacy, our pedagogy, and our ethnic heritage. All of these are mere blessings from God. He gave that to us, but just like Peter took the gift of Moses and Elijah's temporary presence and wanted to build temples for them, every cultural group seeks to worship at the temple shrine of their own race and skin color and nationalistic heritage and language. We all possess the same drive to enshrine our uniqueness and worship our differences and establish a touted superiority as a false sense of security rooted in pride and self. This kind of identification with self fuels our fears because any look away from Christ alienates us from God. It generates our guilt because any brokenness in our relationship with God represents our own rejection of God's will and God's way and it generates our shame because the enemy uses the platform of our guilt to stand upon and accuse us in the present moment. Instantly we feel a deep seated sense of inadequacy and shame like there's something wrong with me and I'm not enough. This trilogy of fear, guilt, and shame dominates and rules us. Fear dominates our future. Guilt dominates our past while shame consumes our present moment so we cannot be free. We cannot help but hide from a searching God and run in fear from a cruel insensitive world with this mindset. This results in a humanity relating like strangers instead of a family, a nation of immigrants that now fears immigrants, a broken people looking down their noses at other broken people. And in the final analysis, we have endless restlessness, strife, and war. Oh, but thanks be to God, for even though we find this trouble in the Bible and this same trouble in the world, I've also found God's grace in the Bible and God's grace in the world for these circumstances. First, see the grace in the Bible. Verse 7 says, a cloud came over them. And a voice came out of that cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no man, any old woman, no man, nobody there anymore except Jesus, the Christ. And therein lies the beginning of grace 
in the Bible for Peter, James, and John, that God would remove the very objects of their fixation and refocus their attention on Jesus the Christ. The voice from the cloud simply says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. You've heard Moses in the law and you've heard prophet Elijah, now just listen to Jesus the Christ. And so I sat back in my chair, ready to hear what Jesus would say. Hmm? But Jesus didn't say very much in the next verses of this passage. He simply said, don't mention this until after my death and resurrection. It seems like something about the death and resurrection of Jesus speaks volumes more than any words from the lips of Jesus. And I wanted to know why Jesus didn't have more to say. And I sat up late last night wrestling with the text to understand how God's voice from the cloud could say, this is my son, listen to him. Yet he didn't have very much to say in the passage. And finally, early this morning, as I prayed over this message, I heard the Spirit say, Peter, Peter, some things require much more than words. And so just look at Mount Calvary, for there the blood speaks. And then I got it. On this Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus points to his shed blood on Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary fixes the trouble of the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, don't tell this story till you have experienced Calvary. And that's all I came to say to you this day, for therein lies God's grace in the world, the blood of Calvary. 2,000 years ago, Jesus drew every human being with cords of love. He carried the entire fragmented, divided, broken human family with him up on Mount Calvary. All humanity stood doomed and condemned without hope in the world but that all changed when he shed his blood and that shed blood now speaks on our behalf oh the blood still speaks for on that cross with his dying last dying breath he said it is finished oh how the blood speaks what his words could not say you see neither peter james nor john nor any of us can embrace a glorified lord until we first talk about a crucified savior something about his death on calvary forms the context and transformative power of the transfiguration you see in mark chapter 9 christ jesus is glorified because he will be crucified. This glorious transfiguration prefigures his shameful crucifixion and his precious blood shed freely on Mount Calvary speaks for every man, woman, boy, or girl. The blood of Jesus did what we could not do for ourselves. We could not free ourselves from the bondage of sin, but by his precious blood, we have been set free. Oh, how do you know the blood speaks, brother preacher? Oh, I thought you'd never ask historically the blood has always spoken in Genesis chapter 4 verse 10 God says to Cain the blood of thy brother Abel cries out from the ground but then in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24 the amplified Bible reads it this way and to Jesus the mediator the go-between agent of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler, more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out for vengeance. The blood of Abel cried out to God for vengeance and punishment, but Christ's blood speaks and cries out for mercy and pardon. The blood speaks of far better things like eternal life and freedom and victory and power and love and grace. Oh, the blood speaks of all us as part of God's great family. I'm not knocking multiculturalism or individuality or internationalism. I'm just saying we all belong to God's great familyism. I'm just saying that's the way it is in God's world. I'm a Canadian. My mother birthed me in Trinidad. My wife, Melissa, was born in Guyana. My son, Jesse, was born in Barbados. My daughter, Jasmine, was born right here in these United States. But all of us form one family. Hmm? Your birthplace 
makes no difference. Your cultural heritage doesn't matter. Your language doesn't matter. Your racial identification doesn't matter. And sexual orientation doesn't matter. All of us together make up God's family because the blood that binds us is greater than the water that divides us. All from different lands and cultures and places, but all from one family. Acts chapter 17 verse 26 says, God made of one blood, one red blood, all nations. Satan ruined all humanity in one man, Adam, but God redeemed all humanity in one man, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, Romans 8, 17 says, what, when we accepted Jesus as our Savior and the blood was applied to our hearts, we became children of God and joined heirs to, uh, with Jesus Christ in God's family. And we all collectively share a new life, the life of God. Oh, the blood speaks of who we are and whose we are and what we have. It speaks to us of righteousness. We cannot stand before God in self-righteousness, but we can stand before him in the righteousness of Jesus because of his shed blood. They wounded him in his head for our evil thoughts. They wounded him in his hands for our evil deeds. They wounded him in his feet for our evil walk. They wounded him in his side for that inordinate affection called lust. And from these wounds, the blood flows and the blood speaks to cancel all sins that haunt us in our past, distract us in our present, and tempt us in our future. The blood speaks to break the shackles that bind us and shatter the glass ceilings that limit us and demolish the barriers that bar us and white out the lines that divide us and out the fires of hell that threaten to consume us and dry up the watery seas that separates us and complete the sad stories that entangle us and show the love that saves us and the grace that redeems us and the spirit that fills us and the joy that thrills us. Oh, the blood speaks. I like how Watchman Nee says it in the normal Christian life. The blood is for God and speaks to God. And nobody can place more value in the blood than God can. For God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over. So the blood speaks to quench the wrath of an angry God against sin so that I no longer live fearful of God. God ain't mad at me because the blood of Jesus still speaks. And if God values the blood of Jesus enough to forgive our sins, then every child of God must also value value the blood for the blood of Jesus also speaks to every man, woman, boy and girl uh, to cleanse a guilty conscience and to free us from our past. But then since Satan stands on the platform of our guilt and accuses us of being unworthy in the present moment and causes us to feel a sense of shame, this blood must also speak towards Satan to silence all his accusations. But how does he do that, brother preacher? How does the blood do that? Oh, the blood of Jesus puts God on my side against Satan. Oh, I got to quit now, but I want you to know God may never send me to Mexico to start a new social order. God may never send me to Venezuela to end political unrest. God may never send me to Colombia to eradicate drug cartels. God may never send me, he may never ask me to help Armenia acquire real prosperity and freedom. He may never lead me to Haiti to lift that nation out of dire poverty. I may never feel called to India to end the caste system and bring relief to the millions of untouchables. I may never have a chance to go to North Korea to end the evil dictatorship of King Jong-un's oppressive communist regime. I may never have the opportunity to go to the Philippines to end the continuous scourge of annual typhoons ravishing some of the 7,100 islands every year. God may never send me to Nigeria to shut down the armed Boko Haram militia that kidnaps young girls seeking an education. I may never have the power to fix the permeating injustices that plague our own country here in the United States. But by God's grace and by God's power, I'll go anywhere to tell everybody and anybody that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flow 
lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. Ah, oh, no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I invite you today to plead the blood of Jesus in every situation, for every circumstance, for every issue, for every problem. Plead the blood of Jesus over your family, over your household, over your workplace, over your education, over your future. Plead the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has a power, and that blood will never lose its power. If you want to accept his blood as payment for your sins today, and you pledge to plead the blood, won't you just stand with me all over the building? Stand with me, and let's worship him with this song, The Blood of Jesus. That Jesus shed on me way, way back on the reef. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. For it reaches to the highest mountain, mountain, and it flows through the lowest valley, valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose. Well, it soothes my doubts and calms all my fears, and it wipes away all my tears. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day—it will never. For it reaches to the highest mountain, mountain, and it flows through the lowest valley, valley, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will know. It's power. Gracious God, we thank you. Thank you today for the precious blood of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that it still has power. It still works today. It brings healing. It brings transformation. It brings change. It brings satisfaction to our hearts. Lord, today for this great community of faith. Lord, we come from different places. We are of different origins. But Lord, I thank you today that we are all one family in Christ Jesus because of the blood. Lord, I thank you today that we can claim the blood and plead the blood and apply the blood. And I just pray right now for each one here under the sound of my voice that this blood, the blood of Jesus, would go to work in our lives, bring about transformation, bring about healing, bring about settling of arguments and fixing of fights, bring about all that we need, oh God, bring about answers to our problems, solutions to our issues, bring about a complete transformation of our humanity. 
But Lord, we pray and we know and we trust that this blood will never lose its power. And so as we go from this place today, oh God, I just ask that we will continue by your Spirit's presence to claim the blood and plead the blood and apply the blood. Help us never to forget that the blood of Jesus still speaks even today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Be seated.